Hello, everyone. I am Rama Nathan, one of the organizers of Data Philly, a community run meetup group in Philadelphia, USA. Founded in 2013, we have grown to over 5,000 data science practitioners and enthusiasts. We host monthly speaker events and workshops focused on the latest technologies and concepts in data science. You can follow us on Meetup and on Twitter. Even if you live outside Philadelphia, we invite you to join our virtual events. I would like to now introduce you to our next speaker, Craig Taverner, a senior software engineer at Neo4j. Craig has been using Neo4j since 2009, first as a customer, building mobile telecommunications analysis tools, and later as a community member, creating the Neo4j Spatial, GIS modeling library. Then in 2014, he joined the product engineering team at Neo4j to work full time on Cypher and on Spatial. Today, he'll be presenting on building search algorithms for Neo4j. Thank you and welcome Craig. Hello, my name is Craig Taverner and today I'm going to be talking about building spatial search algorithms for Neo4j. Some of you who may have attended last year's Nodes 2019 will recognize their title as the same title that I gave last year. And in fact, this presentation is uh, closely related. However, I've decided to dive into the algorithms in a little bit more depth, spend some more time on the demo, and I've done a few optimizations that you might find interesting. Uh, as a result of that, I've also had to leave a few things out. And over the years, anyone who's been following the work that I've done may have noticed that I've presented at quite a few conferences and there have been quite a few things that I've done in the spatial Fournier for j area. I'm gonna skip over all of the background that I normally give and instead refer you only to some of the recordings of YouTube videos and other presentations that I've made on both the uh, spatial algorithms library as well as various other libraries. So I will not go into the background. Uh, you may ask questions about that. I can talk about it in the chat if you wish, but I'm gonna stick mostly to spatial algorithms. So let's get straight on to that. What is this about? Last year, we had an intern from the University of Eindhoven and he came out to Sweden because he's from the, the Netherlands. He came out to Sweden and spent three months in the Neo4j engineering office in Malmö. And he did an internship with me writing spatial algorithms. And what was really interesting about this project was unlike previous spatial libraries that we've worked on, we didn't make use of any third party spatial algorithm library. We wrote these from scratch. And that was really nice because what we were looking for was an opportunity to find out how do spatial algorithms perform on a native graph database? If you are going to run the algorithm natively across the graph, or is it better perhaps to build intermediate memory structures that are optimized for uh, these algorithms? What is the best? And the report, which is available in the uh, GitHub repository, if you're interested, I'll give you links at the end, does have some of the benchmarking results. I'm not going to go into any detail on that other than to say, it was not surprising to discover that if we create intermediate memory representations that are suited, suited to analytics, they do perform better than traversing across the graph. Neo4j is a general purpose graph designed for traversal in all directions and high concurrent writes, whereas analytics typically uh, are optimized for certain structures with no concurrent writes. I will not go into more detail on that benchmarking. I'd like to rather start by describing some of the algorithms. The, the first one I'm gonna describe was not part of this project. This is root finding, but it's something that everyone's interested in. So I'm going to describe the root finding, then show you a demo of that as well as all the algorithms and then go into more detail on the algorithms. Let's start with data. We needed a data set that was uh, very rich, dense, large, and was spatial and was graph. And by far the best choice of this is OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap is a massive graph of the entire planet. Uh, it is also crowdsourced, which means the data can be quite noisy. 
There can be many errors in it. There can also be many different ways that individuals decide uh, they would prefer to add to the data. So we needed to deal with all of those cases, but it's still, it is the most valuable possible data set. I'm going to describe it only very briefly here. I have described in much more detail in the Graph Connect 2018 talk, how we massage this data to be better suited to routing and to other algorithms. So if you're interested in that, you can go look at that. Here, I'm gonna give you just a brief idea of what we've done. If you look at the graph in the middle of the screen there, uh, this is a simplified view of what we have. The bottom row are what OpenStreetMap calls nodes. It's not exactly the same thing that Neo4j calls a node. Their term node basically represents an, an object that has a location on the map. So every one of those nodes will have a location. Now you need to connect those nodes together into a way, and that means a chain of nodes. So if you look at this graph, we have got a thing in between the way and the node. The ways are higher up, and then there's something in between the way and the node, which we call a way node. In OpenStreetMap, they represent a way node as a join table. In Neo4j, we have join tables usually as actual Neo4j nodes. And if you look at this here, you'll see that three of our nodes are connected in one chain and another three in another chain, but one of the nodes is connected into both chains. This means that these two chains are joined together. From a spatial aspect, think of them as line segments, two line segments that join. The reason why they were not done as one line segment could be up to the original author of the data. He might have just decided that, or it could be a really good reason, like, for example, a street that changed name. The name will be up on the way, and if it changes name, you need to do two line segments. Above ways, you have relations. Relations is just a grouping concept that allows us to group anything. Relations can contain other relations, ways, or nodes. So, for example, a province might have a whole bunch of ways representing the outline of the province, and it might have a single floating node representing the name of the province and where on the map you'd want to print it if you were going to draw the map. So it's a very general concept. For the purpose of today's presentation, we're mostly interested in relations that connect ways together into polygons and multi-polygons. So what we found by analyzing the OpenStreetMap data was that they had quite complicated data structures with a relation could contain many, many polygons. Each of these polygons could contain many holes. So the polygons would be shells, which could contain holes, which could contain another polygon inside that to an arbitrary depth. So we have maintained that concept by building on top of OpenStreetMap a small tree, as you see there, which kind of mirrors the OpenStreetMap's native model, but we kept our own tree because it allowed us to do some performance optimizations. For example, instead of traversing the OpenStreetMap's raw data to get the polygon during an algorithm, we could actually find all of those points, make a single property point array and stick it up into the shell or the hole. And that meant when doing algorithms, we could optimize them by searching much faster. So this library and this project does include procedures within Neo4j for building these cached memory structures to make the algorithms faster. This is the only slide that I've kept from old presentations about Neo4j's built-in spatial, because this today we're talking about this spatial algorithms library. However, Neo4j does have a built-in spatial concept that only deals with points, no polygons, no line strings, nothing else. But the reason I raised this is that we need to keep in mind uh, the difference between 2D and 3D, as well as between geographic and Cartesian. For today's presentation, we're gonna deal with 2D only, but we are going to look at the difference between geographic and Cartesian, because in the internship, we did something very interesting, which I'll show over here. Many people, when they do spatial analytics, they work in Cartesian coordinates, even when they're dealing with uh, the planets and with the earth, right? So normally you would think of data on the earth as being latitude and longitude, but when you ever, whenever you draw the map showed on a screen or do analytics, you're typically going to project it onto a flat plane. 
the screen of your of your computer or a printed out paper map. You project it onto that plane and into coordinates like meters that you can then perform normal analytics on. So if you want to know the distance between two points, you're going to use Pythagoras' equation or maybe some trigonometry on that Cartesian coordinate system. It turns out, however, that there is mathematics for doing all this purely in geographic coordinate systems. And that's what we've attempted in this library. When dealing with a geographic coordinate system, we do the mathematics using the actual polar coordinates. And it starts with what you see in the right-hand side diagram there. The definition of a great circle is defined by that little n vector, the vector perpendicular to the circle. And that defines these great circles. We can then use vector algebra, dot products and cross products, to perform everything we need when it comes to doing intersections and distances and areas, which is really, really great. I'm only going to show you one or two equations. Mostly, if you want to know more about this, read the paper. So I'm demonstrating that in the algorithm. We first presented this at Graph Connect 2018, and we used data from New York. So you see Manhattan over there. We did some root finding, and it worked pretty well. There were some rough edges, but uh, I think it went quite nicely. We then, a year later, presented it for San Francisco and improved it. And then last year and this year, we are using uh, Sweden. So I imported two weeks ago uh, the latest Swedish OpenStreetMap data from OpenStreetMap. It's a very large data set. And I did all of the preparatory work to get the routing graph prepared. And uh, the preparation of the routing graph, you can find out more about it by watching the Graph Connect 2018 talk. What it ends up with is a possibility to follow root relationships, as you see on the screen here. And the simplest possible way to do that in Cypher is with the shortest path function, which is a function built into Cypher. So a Cypher query like the one you see over there on the left has uh, two match statements to find the two places you're interested in. In this case, I'm looking for um, a restaurant called Mia Maria's, which is right across the street from the neo j office in Malmo, and uh, another office uh, called Fossi, which is right across town from, uh, from neo j And I look for the shortest path between the two of these. The consequence, when I do this in the demo, and I, I can show you, is a rather strange path. And that looks a little odd. It seems to be going out into the docklands and then it goes off and does this big loop around Malmo. The reason for that is that it isn't actually correct. This is not an ideal path. The shortest path function in Cypher is always going to look for the shortest number of hops. It is a graph only concept. It's not weighted. It doesn't consider distance. So highways will be made of very long line segments that uh, will take a long time, even if you're driving fast. And that's why I chose the highway, uh, because it was fewer hops. If instead we use a different algorithm, and I'll change it there. See the highlighted part on the left there? I've just changed it to call the Dijkstra algorithm. And I've told it, yes, follow the root relationships, but weight it by distance. That means it's going to find the shortest path by distance, and you end up with what you see on the right, a much, much better path. So this is a massive optimization. It makes it much, much more useful. I want to say a little bit more about weighted paths before we get to the demo. First of all, you need to prepare your graph so that you do have these properties on the relationships. We had to calculate the distances between every single intersection and store it on the graph in advance to make a routing graph. Now, a professional product that does routing is going to do a lot more than just calculate distances. It's going to model uh, speed. The speed, not just what the speed limit is, but perhaps a live speed, traffic conditions, a lot of other things. But you need to at least start with something like this. And then, of course, you can find the shortest pass by their total weight and total distance. Now, there are two weighted shortest path algorithms available 
in the APOC library that we used for the demo. One is Dijkstra, which is a monodirectional breadth-first search. And the other one, a star, is a lot faster because you give it a second function. You don't only have the function defining the weight for the path length, you also have a function defining a kind of preferred direction, and that will go a lot faster. For the data sets we're working in, we don't see an obvious difference. So a star gets useful when you deal with very much more complicated data sets. So I, uh, as I mentioned before, we've demoed this before. I'm going to switch to the demo and show you exactly how this works in our app. Right, I have a demo over here, which uh, shows Sweden. And if I zoom in on Malmo here, you'll see I've already done some shortest path calculations. This is where our office is. Let's get rid of some of the selections here and get it back. So the way the shortest path works is you need to select play, uh, points of interest, for example, that one, which is right across the street from uh, our office. And then you will, of course, find the point to, let me just uh, take away these selections here. Right. So I'm going to, as I did in that presentation, find something quite far away from the office down here, for example. And exactly as we saw, we got a really bad path. That doesn't look good at all. It's following the highway and it's definitely not the shortest path. There must be a shorter route. So on the left, I have the choice of algorithm. I'm going to switch it to Dijkstra and we'll see that gives a much, much, much faster route to take. What we can also do is uh, search larger areas. Um, but what I want to show you as well, I mentioned before the preparation of the data. In order to do this, we need to have created a graph that can be routed across. So there is a feature in this app for demonstrating the routing graph. It's going to slow the app down a little bit, but there we go. So this is a debug option that I've turned on. And it's important to remember that OpenStreetMap will have points along the way for every bend in the road. It needs to be able to draw the map. So it's optimized for being able to draw the map. But when you want to do routing, you don't care about that. If you have a long wiggly road, you don't care about routing over 100 points. You just want to know the relationship from the intersection point, a place where you may, might make a decision to another intersection point and the total distance. So what I've displayed on the map right now is the routing graph that we overlaid on top of OpenStreetMap. We wrote some procedures that will crawl the OpenStreetMap graph, find intersection points, find the points of interest, and it's then going to connect them in a simplified graph that is optimized for routing. And there are two aspects to this graph. One is relationship between intersections, and the other one is how do you get from a restaurant to the street? So if I zoom in on some area over here, you'll see what we've done for that. These little green lines are the special relationships we've added between points that were free floating on the map like this one here says graffiti cafe so graffiti cafe was not connected into the graph how can you route if you're not connected into the graph well we calculated the closest street and then you calculated the point on that street interpolated because quite often there wasn't a, an existing point add a point to the graph put a relationship in there and connect all the points of interest into a fully routable graph. Let's move on to another part of the demo. So I'm going to zoom out and show you polygons. What I started with 
is I went to something like this. This is the actual OpenStreetMap's own view. And in OpenStreetMap, you can investigate the underlying layers. And I did a search for objects that were considered to be provincial boundaries. And when I found them, I could select them and get a, a view like this on the left. I, you don't need to worry about the details, but what it has done is shown me that I've correctly found the administrative boundary of the province of Skåne in Southern Sweden. And so once I recognize that, I can then say this is useful for the polygon algorithms. So I just recorded this into the app. And if I click on Scorner and enable showing of polygons, there you see the provincial boundary of Scorner. I also incidentally found only the land area. So there is just the land area. So you can do quite a lot by investigating OpenStreetMap, very rich. Spend enough time and you'll find a lot of things. But what I've put into this map is simply the identities of all of the provinces so that I can, for example, click in a few areas like this and it will search for, so I had a cipher equation, cipher query. Uh, when I click on the map, it passes that point to the database and says, find a province that contains this point using the algorithm point in polygon, which I will describe in a bit more detail. So that was very, very useful. Let's go out a little bit and find things further away. This one around Östersund. This one's interesting because it actually has uh, many sub polygons. I mentioned that we've got multi polygons here. I will zoom in and show you. I think there was some over here. There we go. This is interesting. So this province, Jemtland, has got a hole over here. So obviously this particular town decided it didn't want to be in that province. It gets quite complicated. It's quite amazing. An important point about this is that the um, border of this polygon is very complicated. So we have got every tiny little detail at the finest resolution. So the polygon I'm drawing over here is actually very, very complicated. It has data for tens of thousands of points, which of course is quite impressive when you consider how fast the uh, drawing is on this map. Also impressive when I show you the next algorithm, which is the calculation of area. I'm going to select the button down here and there we get the areas. And the area calculation here is say, taking the sum of all the shells and then subtracting all the holes and giving you the correct combined area. And it does it instantly. Now I demonstrated this last year's demo as well and it worked pretty well, but something that did not work last year was the calculation of distances. That went pretty badly. Uh, it took over a minute. And I used that minute to try to explain what the problem was with the distance calculation. This year, I'm pleased to report I have done an optimization. Let's click on the distance selection over here. We should see some distances. There we go. That took, what do you think, four seconds? I don't think it took very long at all. Now, the way the algorithm originally worked was it would break every polygon down into all of the little line segments that they're made of, tens of thousands of line segments for each polygon. And then it would compare every line segment in one polygon to every other line segment in another. That's of the order of n squared. It explodes. The only way that you can do this fast is through simplifications. So I took two approaches. One approach I can show you first is the convex hull. If we do a convex hull, that is a simplification of the polygon. So this is another algorithm that we're demonstrating and I will talk about in the presentation. Convex hull can be thought of as taking an elastic band around the polygon. So it uh, makes a polygon of hundreds of thousands of points, something maybe that contains 10, 20 points, and then suddenly 
the comparisons uh, are very, very, very fast. However, they don't give the same answers. So this is only an approximation. For example, if you look down here, this line is not correct because the actual border of scorn is down here. If I take away convex hull and let it recalculate, you'll see it actually draws a line to a different point. It found a different closest point. So convex hull is not giving the right answers. It's the correct answer for the convex hull. It's not the right answer for these complex polygons. So how did I get this to be fast? I'm going to show you when you get back to the presentation. Right, one last thing I will show you before we move to the presentation is the other thing that I did to make this fast is I stopped at calculating distances between every sub polygon, but I can put that back on again. If I put that back on again, you see it'll take a little bit longer, but we still managed to get it done in a reasonable time, but we're going to end up with a lot of distances because it's basically going to treat here. Yeah, there we go, every single sub polygon is treated as an independent polygon. It's calculating the distances between them all. And that's uh, too much. So we don't have that on by default. So needless to say, today's demo is a lot richer than it was last year. And we've figured out quite a few things that we didn't know last year. So I'm going to switch back to the presentation and explain these algorithms to you. Right, I'd like to talk about five algorithms. We don't have that much time left, so I'll go through them each quite quickly. And um, feel free to ask questions in the chat. We'll try to answer them. First one, point in polygon. Uh, I like that one a lot because I wrote that myself uh, two years ago, and then Steph took it and ported it to geographic coordinate systems and moved it into the library. But the idea is very, very simple. So I'll just explain it briefly. First of all, you need your polygon, which we've talked about. Um, well, this is the polygon work. We need to find points of interest. Yeah, this I need to explain first. How do you display points on a map if you need, if you've got a database with hundreds of thousands of points, you only want to show points that are either on the screen or in the circle, like I showed you in the demo, or within a polygon. And this is the way our demo is working. It's actually combining two functions, distance, which I've highlighted there, and the line below it within polygon. And the reason we use both of those functions is because we want to benefit from the spatial index that Neo4j has built in. And the within polygon function is something we've added in this library. Neo4j doesn't understand it, and therefore it won't be able to use it for the spatial index. However, Neo4j does understand distance. So while we use both of those, when Cypher sees this query, it knows that it can take that distance one and back it with an index and get a fast result and then do a post filtering on the within, within polygon. So what do you do if you want to use an index, but you don't want that circle? You don't want a distance function. You only want the polygon. There is a trick, and I'm going to explain that with this equation. If you compare the previous line, let's go back one. There's this gap in the query there. What I'm going to insert into that gap is some preparation that I can use later on. So have a look at what's added there. I've added a function called bounding box. I pass the polygon to that function. It's going to return an object called bounding box, which is a map containing two keys, max and min. And now look what I've done. Instead of using a distance equation, I've said I need my points to be greater than min and less than max. Neo4j Cypher understands that as something it can use an index for. So what it's done is we've put a box around the polygon and we've passed that to the index. So it's going to find everything in that box and then do a post filtering with the polygon. This is great. So we've tricked Neo4j into index backing uh, without having any knowledge of polygons or any knowledge of what the within function, within polygon function or the bounding box function means. So that's a very nice trick. Right, moving to the actual point in polygon algorithm. This is very simple. All you do is you take the point that you're interested in and you take a ray in any direction 
I've chosen just to follow the x-axis. And you count intersections between that ray and the polygon itself. If the number of intersections is odd, you're inside the polygon. If it's even, you're not. Have a look at those two examples. That red point is enveloped by the polygon, but it's not actually inside it. It has an even number. So the underlying primitive you need is the ability to count, to detect intersections. So that's an important thing. Next one, polygon area. Uh, this one we demonstrated very, very fast, even on very complicated polygons. And this is because the algorithm is actually quite straightforward. What you do is you pick a point. It can be inside the polygon or not, doesn't really matter. You can just take the origin, for example. Um, and then what you do is you take every line segment and make a triangle between that line segment and that origin point. And you calculate the area of the triangle. And you go all around the polygon, summing those areas. But notice the fact that when the line segment inverts, the area should be negative. And you end up uh, subtracting those um, red shaded areas, and you end up with the actual final total. So it's quite a, a nice, simple algorithm that works surprisingly fast. In geographic coordinates, there was an alternative version of this that makes use of the uh, polar coordinates. And I mentioned to you in the beginning about the fact that we can use uh, vector algebra. And the main thing is the ability to detect these intersections. And then you use this equation. I'm not going to go in more detail on this one. You can have a look at the paper, but it basically performs as well for very similar reasons to the other one. So when we actually want the area, how do we do that? Well, I mentioned we've got this tree structure of shells and holes and shells and holes. So of course you calculate the sum of all the shells and subtract the all the holes in order to get it with a query like we see on the left. And it works really well. Next one, polygon intersection. Um, didn't manage to get this into the demo, but polygon intersection is something that gets used by many of the other algorithms. As I mentioned with the, the area one needs it as well, and the distance one needs it as well. And the point in polygon needs it, so quite a few of them need intersection. So how does intersection work? Well, here's one al algorithm called monotone chain sweep. What you do is you have sorted your line segments from left to right, top to bottom, and then you're going to sweep across. And you basically decide if a point is in between any two line segments. And whenever you do this, you can actually see when an intersection occurs. When the intersection occurs, you create a new point at that intersection and then continue the sweep. And this allows you to work out the complete set of all intersecting points between any two bags of line segments, which of course could be two polygons. And of course, we have repeated this algorithm in geographic coordinates. This one has one subtle challenge, and that is since the great circle is defined by uh, that vector, it goes all around the planet, any two points on that circle should define a line segment, but is it this way around the planet or that way around the planet? So that does mean that these algorithms are sensitive to the possibility that your polygon actually envelops the Earth, which is almost never the case. So we've mostly assumed that uh, it's the shortest distance between the two points that is the real line segment. This is an important point here about the fact that the shortest distance when projected is actually a long curve. So it was very important to be able to take this into account. We have to switch to great circles for everything. And this affected quite a few of our algorithms. So that monotone sweet intersection thing needed to be treated slightly differently. And uh, that was done in geographic coordinates successfully. So moving on to the second last algorithm, and that is distance. This one I'm going to go into slightly more detail because as I mentioned in the demo, it was very slow last year and we had to do an optimization. So in polar, coordinates, the distance is actually not using what we would normally have done in Cartesian, you'd use Pythagoras. Here we're going to use a polar equation, in this case, 
it's r times r, the arctan of the cross products and the dot products. And this actually works very well and is very, very fast. And it's equivalent. How do we query this? Well, this is the query that was slow. If you look on the right there, I've got three polygons and yet I'm seeing more than three distances. And that's because the uh, polygon around Gothenburg has this small hole in it and it's actually calculated that as well. So I mentioned that in the demo. If you look at the query over here, what am I doing? I'm doing two large match statements. I'm doing a big match that says find the OSM relation. That's the grouping construct that represents the entire polygon. Traverse down the polygon structure with a star. See where it says the polygon structure star. That means I'm going to traverse down that whole tree and find all of the sub polygons. And I'm going to do it for the other polygon as well. So this query I'm showing you right now is for all pairs of polygons. And I'm then going to do the distance calculation at the end. And then you're going to end up with all of these distances. So one of the optimizations we did was to look at the shells only. That's this equation, this uh, query. If we look what I've done right now, I've taken away the star. So I'm actually only traversing the polygon structure, not to find the polygon, just to know that one exists. So the actual polygon structure above there, I'm not using at all. Instead, if we go down to the second half of the query where we do where we call the function polygon shell i'm passing into the polygon shell only the original relation not the polygon itself inside that function we again traverse the tree and we find the single largest outer shell and we return that only so i'm simplifying the polygon from a multi polygon to a simple polygon and then i do the distance calculation and that's what you see on the right that's what people intended when they asked for distance and it is faster because it did fewer calculations. But this wasn't the main optimization. The main optimization is this one. And I did describe this when I did the demo briefly. If we look at that top piece of Java code there, we've got two nested for loops. I go through every single line segment of the one polygon. And for every one, I go through every single line segment of the other polygon. This means it's order n squared. And I calculate the distance for every one of those pairs and then find the minimum one. Very, very expensive. Does not scale to complicated polygons. This will only work if we have very simple polygons. So look what I do at the bottom here. This is the faster version. The first equation over there, I do the expensive version, but on the convex hull. And I showed you in the demo that convex hulls are very, very simplified compared to uh, the full polygon. So instead of having 10, 20, 100,000 points, you're going to have maybe 10 or 20. That's it. So getting the simple distance, which we saw was an approximate distance, is very, very fast. Now I can take one polygon and that approximate distance object and calculate between the line segments of the polygon and a single point. So it's not going to be order n squared, it'll be order n log n, because we have to do the sort. So this is very, very much faster, uh, especially very large data sets. The performance problems we saw in last year's demo were all about the fact that these polygons are very, very dense, tens or hundreds of thousands of points. This optimization saves you from that. It was really dramatic. So what uh, we could do is look at the actual code for the user-defined functions, but I think that we're running a bit low on time. So what I'll do is I'll describe the last algorithm first and see if we have any questions and only look at that code if we have time. So the final algorithm, you've seen it demonstrated. I talked about how I needed to use this in my distance optimization, and that is the convex hull. And the convex hull is, I think, very interesting. Just as the point in polygon was close to my heart because it's the first one that I wrote, convex hull was the first one that Steph wrote, and uh, that has some you know, emotional meaning to it. So 
You saw in the demo what convex hull looks like. You take a very complicated polygon and you simplify it by wrapping an elastic band around it. How does this work? What is the actual equation? What is the algorithm for that? Well, the algorithm we used in general is called a Graham scan. And the way that works is you take the points that comprise the polygon. You forget that it's a polygon, it's just a cloud of points because we're gonna build a new polygon around that cloud. You sort that cloud in terms of angular degree from some origin. And the traditional origin is to take the bottommost point, and if there's more than one bottommost point, the leftmost of that. It doesn't really matter what you choose, but this is just a convention. So you take that origin point, and then all other points, you sort them by the angle around it. Now you scan those angles. And what you want to find out is between any three points on that scan, is the middle one in or out? If it's in, you throw it away. If it's out, you keep it. So if I look at what's happened there, the first black point was kept, the next one where the corner is thrown away, then the next one, which we've labeled A, is kept. Then we're looking at ABC. In that ABC, we simply look at the angle between AB and we'll say BA and BC. That angle, is it less than or greater than 180 degrees? If it's less, you throw away B. Then you're gonna look at AC and the next one. And you can continue to iterate around. So you're just simply throwing away points whenever the angle is less than 180 degrees. Now, this is Cartesian. Polar doesn't work because those angles are uh, not the polar angles. In polar, we need to do something slightly differently. If you look at that great circle, the great circle doesn't go around the planet, it goes over the planet. So we wouldn't be able to tell the angle correctly. What we wanna do instead is look for intersection. So if you take the line from the North Pole to the point that we're testing, does that line intersect with the line before? So if, if we use the terminology we used on the previous slide, A, B, C, you've got A and C are the red ones and B is the blue one. You create a line segment with AC and a line segment with North Pole B, and if they intersect, you throw away B. If they don't, you keep it and continue. So it's an interesting simplification and it works very, very well. And this is how you would query it. It's very simple. The top query, we simply get a polygon and the bottom query, we simply added that function, convex hull, and it will return a much, much, much simpler query, which will go really, really fast. And that is it for the presentation. Um, I had, Receive some queries, uh, some questions in advance, so I can just answer one or two of them. Uh, people are interested in whether this works on the latest versions of Neo4j, because all of the previous presentations I've done, I've almost demonstrated on Neo4j 3.4 or 3.5. Well, the good news is just two weeks ago, I released versions of the OpenStreetMap library and the spatial algorithms library for Neo4j 4.0 and 4.1. And I can even show you that briefly where you can find that. All right, this is the OpenStreetMap library. The URL you'll be able to um, get from the presentation itself, but if you go to GitHub and go to Neo4j contrib, that's where most of these libraries are. This one is very simply called OSM. And it's being released. You can look at releases, 4.0, 4.1. And the README will help explain to you how to build it, if you want, how to run it, how to do very high performance imports. Some of the things that needed to change for the 4.0 series, it was a little bit of work to get this ported. And some of the procedures you can use for building routing graphs which is uh, obviously very, very interesting for this demo. The other library, Spatial Algorithms, is also a Neo4j contrib. I've also made releases now uh, against 4.0 and 4.1. And uh, the readme here will explain also 
some of the algorithms, how to access it. Um, I will add some more to the README very soon about this nested polygon work that we've done recently. And if there are no more questions, then uh, I will remain online for answering in the chat session. Thank you very much.